Hey, this is Steve in Dallas, Texas. It's Saturday morning, my friend, and you are listening to Light Talk. Good morning. This is Zach in Washington, D.C., and today we are discussing dance blooms, buying a few Lico's, Travis Scott, live video, and tumbleweeds, all on Light Talk. And this is David coming to you from the beautiful Belmont Shore neighborhood of Long Beach, California. And if you don't already know, you are listening to Light Talk, and we are the Lumen Brothers. That's right, Zach, Steve, and David. Here to entertain you and hopefully inform you <laughs> or misinform you. We were the kings of misinformation, I'm afraid, sometimes. So, anyway. Welcome, everyone, to episode 241. And we're going to start wow. off. What, what, Zach, and what's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> I heard you groaning in the background. I was saying, wow, just 241. I mean, I don't know if there's a, a material or an object that goes for your 241st. Uh, podcast, but that's a significant achievement. It's something petrified, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's some organic petrified uh, material that we deserve for going 241. Hey, you know, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about news. All right, news today. Boy, there's yes, lots let's. of news, lots of news. Uh, first of all, hey, what? We're one week from... LDI and the great light talk live simulcast, whatever the hell we do there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of people are going. This is fantastic because I was uh, checking out the lighting designers uh, group over in Facebook and someone says, roll call, who's going to LDI? And I would say about 90% of the people who answered that roll call said, I'm going. So, that's kind of cool. Yay. Yeah. So we're going we're gonna to have a crowd. We're going to have a crowd. Uh, we we do have an issue, though, with our swag. It's still in the container it's ship? It's in the container ship. Uh, we ordered some special balls for swag, and uh, they were made in China. And I, see, I still see the ship out there docked right next to one of the carnival ships that's been out there for two years. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I shouldn't laugh, but it's, it is kind of funny. Uh, so, no, because there's still people at the all-you-can-eat buffet on it. That's right. They're, they're waiting to get off. <laughs> oh, God. I think there's skeletons. It's like a skeleton cruise by now. So we have come up with alternate swag and we've gone back well we i kind of we, we might as well tell we've gone back to a crowd favorite which are the shot glasses everyone uh. who comes to our show will get a free limited edition light talk shot glass is it safe for the dishwasher yes Yes, this actually is safe <laughs> in the dish from the dishwasher. <laughs> so <laughs> it's okay. Don't worry about it. It's not going to completely fall apart when you put it in your dishwasher. You know, we could save money by just giving out white mugs without the logo <laughs> put on it. <laughs> <laughs> we could do that. You know, I didn't think about that, but that's a good idea. For the listeners who will have these shot glasses at home, is there a shot of choice, a beverage of choice? For the Lumen Brothers podcast that they should be <laughs> filling the shot glass with? I think that's up to the uh, whoever is holding the shot glass, don't you? <laughs> that might be a question on ne next week's episode. But for those who want to get a free hall pass, you could use our own personal limited edition. <laughs> I don't know. It's limited edition. But head retractable. <laughs> Light Talk LDI free hall pass code. Here it is, J-I-C-E-X-H-3. That's Juliet, Indigo, Charlie, Echo, X-Ray, Hotel 3. Use it for free pass to the hall at LDI and, of course, the Light Talk Live at LDI show Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. And then if you want, you can come see our show and get a free shot glass. And we have other prizes because we have some... Uh, Corn dogs? <laughs> we do have some not ready for uh, dishwasher mugs. <laughs> not what? ready for dishwasher players. <laughs> yes, and... <w> <laughs> That's right. With the, that's our, that should be our community theater thing. Instead of the Lumen community players, the not ready for dishwasher players. But we have a special mug. You know, we have. I'm bringing eight mugs because you know we're gonna give them out to people with uh, you know, who actually get their questions chosen. But we do have a surprise mug, and that surprise mug is very, very, very special. So whoever gets the surprise mug 
will get the chance to be Lumen Brother or Sister of the Day, which means that you will co-host Light Talk with Steve, Zach, Ellen, uh, whoever shows up that day. <laughs> and that special mug will be given to one of our people who ask questions. So is that exciting? I feel like a winner every time I'm on this show. <laughs> there you I, go. Don't, I don't think Las Vegas is big enough to hold this. This is like the return of right. Elvis. It is pretty amazing, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, I never thought that we'd actually reach this type of uh, desperation when it came to giving away these coffee mugs. Right. But yes, I hope we have. that you're going to show up like the Blues Brothers with the mug in a briefcase handcuffed <laughs> <Yes>. to you. <laughs> well, oh, I like that. Well, <laughs> you, but here's the key, the key. There are eight mugs. They all look exactly alike. But one of the mugs has that special code on it, and it's going to be whoever the lucky person, you know, you're going to be able to come up there and choose a mug. We'll have the mugs at the table. So when you come up, there are going to be eight mugs, and you just come up, you grab one of them. And if it, you got the special one, you become Lumen Brother <laughs> or Sister the other day. And for a later episode, we're going to have you on the show. Right. So you, it'll be fun. You can have a sign at the table that says loosest mugs in Vegas. <laughs> the loosest <laughs> mugs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh God. I'm gonna I'm gonna pee myself. Okay. So that being said. <laughs> use the mug. Use the mug. Use the mug. Quick, quick, use the I mug. Hope that's not what makes it special. Okay. Yeah, no, I have not peed in that mug. No, no, no. We will whoever gets that mug will know immediately if it's the special mug. But you can't wow. see it from a distance. You can't see it. Even when you go up to the table, you can't see what's what the, what makes that mug special. So there you go. All that being <laughs> said, we're excited about this LDI show. We are, because be, Brackley will be with us, Ellen will be with us, uh, Steve and me, and we may have a special guest. So we will see. We will see. Uh, okay, what else is happening? <laughs> is there anything else? I mean, that, <laughs> no, how can you talk no. that? I went with the top thing here. Uh, the other thing that's happened, and it's sad, it's that what that horrible catastrophe that happened at the Travis Scott concert in Houston. And uh, we're going to be talking about this in our Let's Talk About segment. But that is news, and it's, it's sad news. But again, it's about safety. And it's about safety in the theater or safety in live events that we are partially responsible for. And also in the news is a new <laughs> problem with the Tesla autopilot software. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. The reason, only reason why we talk about this in Light Talk is because I own a Tesla and I was chosen to be a beta tester, <laughs> beta tester, a beta, a beta tester for this new software that makes your car completely autonomous in the city. All right. What city? Any city. <laughs> it, right, it depends. Right. It depends. <laughs> if it's LA, you know, I don't know about that. Well, if it's Bozeman, that's something else. Bozeman. Okay. Well, it could be Bozeman. No, no. The, the problem is <laughs> what, what it says here, I'll just quote what I read in the news today. It says, full self-driving is the latest iteration of the company's software are now in the hands of roughly 12,000 drivers who paid as much as $10,000 to upgrade and received early access or passed a safety screening. Okay, I'm going to stop here. I did not pay $10,000, but <laughs> some, some people did, all right? It adds capabilities to navigate city and residential streets with an attentive owner behind the wheel at all times. But already, <laughs> drivers have been reporting issues. Videos uploaded to social media show the software struggling to navigate roundabouts. That's an issue. Veering toward pedestrians. <laughs> and, and my favorite, and even abruptly turning towards oncoming traffic. <laughs> so they taught it to drive like a Floridian. <laughs> like my old Aunt Jackie. That's how Aunt Jackie drove. She, she was driving when she was 99 years old. That's right. They got there at this... <laughs> <laughs> and she and she'd come to the house for uh, for like Thanksgiving dinner, and my brother and I would go out front, and there'd be like body parts in the uh, grill of her car, you know, from from her like running down people and not realizing it. But you're right, driving like a Floridian or like a or someone right. crazy, a Boynton uh, Beach Floridian. <laughs> we got to be specific. <laughs> you're right. All right. So anyway, I'm not downloading that software. Anyway, so let's get started. Zach has the first question. And here we go. 
Al in Brooklyn writes, I'm doing a show that will have both traditional projections as well as a live video feed. What are some of the things I need to be aware of for using live video? This is a great, great question. And I think it's a really good question for us as a group to answer because I can talk about what you need to know about in terms of video, but there's a whole other component to this, which is how you light things that will also appear in video because it reacts differently than just lighting something for the stage. Uh, so one of the things that you want to be concerned about more than anything else, depending on what kind of hardware and software you're using, is that there often can be some kind of delay between when the live event happens and when it shows up on the screen. It's a super annoying thing, but it's also sort of a reality. You know, we have so many questions about uh, what kind of budget software is there out there for me because I can't afford this stuff. And then, so this is sort of like a companion question is how can I use the budget software that does have like a few nanosecond delay, but still make it feel okay. So I think part of it is just sort of going into it, acknowledging there might be a delay and then looking at, do I need to do anything in terms of sound to make it feel like it's in sync? So like, for instance, in Rock of Ages, we had a live video moment in the show and we actually put a tiny delay on the audio to match the delay in the video so that even if it didn't feel in sync with the music, that the video felt in sync with itself. Because uh, that's sort of the place where you can go off the cliff if it looks like it's canned video when you're trying to make it feel live. I know like they had to do something for uh, Jersey Boys in Vegas where they built in uh, different uh, gaps in the cues for the video so that they could call it like a half a second before the beat and then it would end up doing the thing on the beat. Because they figured <laughs> out we need, we need this extra half a second before the computer will actually react. Um, so, so really making sure that you're, you're dealing with the time delay is probably the number one thing you need to look into. Now, the other thing is depending on if you're doing projection or if it's led screens, how those things are reacting to the way your live moment is lit. You know, is it something where it's uh, on stage? Like again, the Jersey boys example where they were, I guess on they're supposed to be on a black and white TV show and they had the video treated so that when it showed up on the LED screen, it was black and white. In Rock of Ages case, we actually had a whole set built off stage uh, that was supposed to be like a split screen phone call effect. But it had to be lit very differently than the way the stage lighting was because it would have just blown out the uh, screen. You know, state people on stage need a lot of light, whereas the video camera does not need as much most of the time. So have you guys had any experience in dealing with that kind of end of the lighting world? Well, sure. I mean, when I got started, it was it was something goofy, like 120-foot candles for the camera oh, to yeah. see. That would be real I, I remember doing something, and the artist you know, called back to the control room, it's really hot in here. <laughs> and I, you know, we, we pulled the lights down. I walked in. I said, give me that cue. It was like a blast furnace. I mean, the, the, the wave of heat just ran over me. Right. And I, I was working a couple nights ago with a, a cinematographer. And, you know, the battle cry was less light, less light. You know, let the camera do what the camera can do. You know, we were down to, you know, we could have done it in candlelight if we wanted to. So it's, it's become, I think, much, much easier and much better to light stuff now with, with the sophisticated equipment. Uh, so, I don't know if that answered it or not. Yeah, yeah, totally. The, I mean, the super the, high definition chips. I mean, it's it's now very amazing sensitive. Now. sensitive. And uh, just as a point of history, and I'm going to ask Zach this question, and uh, oh, it's boy. a poser. This is like a light talk poser. We're going back to those old days. <laughs> you're going who, for the, you're going for the coffee mug, Zach. <laughs> who was the uh, pioneer director? Who introduced, really truly introduced, low-level lighting and cinematography 
into a major motion picture. And what motion oh, picture was that? Stanley Kubrick? Yes, yes. For what picture? Uh, what's the movie? There's the movie that's only shot with natural light. That's right. Barry uh, Lyndon. Barry Lyndon. Yes, yes. 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 Okay. So, see, Zach, you, you win the coffee mug. Just don't put it in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> so we now have seven coffee right. mugs. At least not with hot water. <laughs> are, they, are they safe for coffee? They are safe for coffee. Just okay, be careful good. of the paint because the paint is a little toxic. All right? Got so it. you never want to lick. Make sure that when you drink right. out of it, you drink out of the Only side. Only drink from the inside of the mug. You can lap it like a dog. Okay, but do not drink the side of the cup of whatever yes. you do. Believe me, you're, you're, you're going to know because you look at the mug and go, what just happened to this what thing? What the hell? Or if you start it's, to it's, see, it's, yeah. You know, it's like our cheap version of the NPR mug that changes right. logos. You know, we, we change logos with hot water. Yes. If you start to see two mugs, stop licking the paint. Do not lick the paint. Never lick the paint of this mug. I'm yeah. telling you that right now. Unless you really are desperate, okay? Lick it, lick it, but don't lick it, Nor. I hope there's a disclaimer at the bottom that no, there's no Lumen disclaimer. Brothers are not responsible for any licking of the mug. But you get a free light talk, not ready for dishwasher mug. You know what you're getting into. So I don't think we need a disclaimer there, okay? It's about as cheap as you right. get. These things are made in China. But anyway, let's, let's, uh, and, let's and move on. And that's what you need to be aware of when you're using live video. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God, I'm choking. Well, I know when I'm uh, using okay. live video, I'm looking over my shoulder at the monitor all the time. Always with, look with at the hand, monitor. With, with, a hand, with my hand on the console. <laughs> I'm only yeah. looking I mean, at the monitor. I mean, we could do a whole episode on the idea now of how, you know, designing for live and video at the same time and the challenges therein. I, you know, that's a whole, that's its own show right there. Well, Becky in Detroit writes, uh, what is better? A dance boom or a dance tower? All right, L let's do a definition here. So uh, a lighting boom is a vertical pipe that's placed on stage. Usually you see this placed on the side in the wings. Lights are hung on the pipe so they can shine onto the stage from a horizontal angle. So you, you take this pipe, typically uh, it is in a flange that is uh, lagged to the floor or it is in a boom base. A boom base is typically 50 pounds, and then that boom base can be weighted also. Um, but again, typically with a boom, you're going to somehow weigh it down to the floor, and you're probably going to attach it to the grid in some way so it can't topple over. Uh, you want to counterbalance the lights that are on it. The lights are placed on it typically with a sidearm. So this is what we think of in dance. We think of this kind of uh, inch and a half inch pipe. It's schedule uh, 40 pipe. Typically, uh, a boom is 18 to 21 feet in height. I believe Schedule 40 pipe in the raw comes in a 21-foot section, so that's, that's why it's a 21-foot height. Uh, you know, the purpose of this is to provide side light, and that angle creates highlights and shadows that make the subjects on the stage appear more three-dimensional. So side lighting from booms is most frequently, frequently used in dance, where body shaping is critical to the performance. You sometimes see them used in theatrical performances, uh, you know, particularly musicals. Again, we're trying to uh, offer uh, a different angle onto the stage, maybe create a special effect that requires a, a, a low side light. So that's kind of what a dance boom is. Now, the other thing is a dance tower. And I have to say, I prefer a dance tower. I think they're a little safer. Uh, a dance tower is a, a vertical truss. And typically, they are 30 inches by 30 inches by 84 inches, so seven feet. And you can stack uh, multiple trusses together. So again, a seven-foot magic number, I put three together, I've got my 21-foot boom again. Uh, often, uh, a dance tower will come on a castered base. And the nice thing about a dance tower is it can be custom-built. You can either have a single hung row of lights in there, or you can have a double wide configuration. And I prefer a double wide. Um, I can use a C-clamp um, to attach it. I can use Unistrut. I can use T's. There's a lot of different ways to attach the light to the dance tower itself. Um, I do think they're safer. I like the look of a, a dance tower if the legs are flown out and we're, we're exposing everything um, open to the stage, to the, to, from the stage to the audience. I think um, a, a difference, which is better, 
Some of it has to do with your budget. Clearly, it's a lot easier and cheaper to buy a boom base and a piece of pipe than it is to buy a, a dance tower. The thing I like a lot about the dance tower, particularly being at a university, is I can load my dance towers up and the lights stay in them. So they go into storage, ready to roll out on stage. So I roll my first tower out, and we just use a, uh, a one-ton motor to pick up the second section and land it on top of the first section. Then again, we take a, the motor and raise the third section and land it on the uh, second section. And then we safety everything off to the grid. I started using dance towers when I started working in Europe. That's really where I'd seen them for the first time. And it made a lot more sense to me um, than a boom. Also, I think there's, su there's such mass in the wings. Uh, you know, they're no really, they're not that much bigger than a boom bass, but they are something a dancer can spot a whole lot easier as they're moving off. What about you guys? Dance tower, Zach, you do a lot of stuff on Broadway. Well, that was, first I just want to thank you because that really was a very well explained definition of the differences in, of the two devices. I think, I think on Broadway, you see the dance tower a lot more than the boom, partly because, you know, with the, the tiny amount of storage and throngs of people running around all over the place, it's almost like it go, the, having the ability to have it go out of the way when it's not needed is, is something that's critical. You know, they go up, people come out, they go back down kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, I'm curious, it sounds like f from what you're saying too, that the, uh, you know, in terms of like keeping your focus, you, you might be better off in the dance tower as well. Um, although you kind of want to hope that it come whenever it moves, that it comes back to where it is supposed to go. Uh, but yeah, I think that we, at this point now, dance tower is pretty much the standard, I think. Well, again, if, I, if I'm going to fly it, I'm going to keep the one ton motor attached to it. Right. And just go right up and come right back down. Right. And I guess then there's the, is it a, is it a flyman or the head flyman? So I think if, uh, if it's a motor, then it's considered the head flyman is the person who operates the motor on Broadway. But if it's a rope or they pull it, then it's just a flyman. So that's the difference. <laughs> well, that's really it. I, I'm learning new things every <laughs> every minute on this show. Uh, that's that's fantastic. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I was uh, watching a, a production in, in London of Billy Elliot, and I noticed that the side lights, which weren't booms, if I'm pretty sure, I believe they were kind of ladders, uh, and it may have been in a dance tower, I'm not too sure, but that would fly up and down for every single scene shift. Right. Fly in and out, fly up and down. Sound like an idiot here. <laughs> fly in and out, <laughs> in and out, right? It goes up and it goes down, gravity, right? And then I don't know how it goes up, but it certainly can come down. It, it's really great because you get out of the way. Now, I have a couple of, of things about these two. Okay, first of all, if you have a light and a dance tower, absolutely, it's more protected. Uh, sometimes you don't never have to focus it again. You just have to spot weld it in place and then put it on the truck and come off. The problem is, is that if you're going to pan the light downstage or upstage more than like 20 or 30 degrees, yeah, you're going to be running into that the structure of the, uh, right. of the light. Now, how often are you going to be doing that with side light, really? When there's projections. When there's projections, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Another reason not to have projections. <laughs> but yeah, you, you, you know, I mean, most of the time those lights are, are shooting just straight across the stage or maybe a little bit upstage or maybe a little downstage, like 10 degrees. But if you can start getting a little bit too much, you're going to start hitting that rail. So uh, that's the other thing. And for people who want to use booms. Do not ever use booms without sidearms. Don't C-clamp that poor light onto the pipe and then try to focus it because it's a pain in the ass. Because what happens is, is that if you want to pan that light upstage, you're on top of a ladder. The light is 18 feet up, right? You got to actually loosen the C-clamp and then move it a bit. Don't force it because you're going to torque that whole boom and rotate it. And all those lights that you've previously focused are now out of focus. If you just do it right the right way, okay, get, get sidearms. So much easier. 
and so much more secure, and it doesn't look cheap. <laughs> it looks somewhat professional. Life is cheap for that kind that doesn't use a sidearm. Oh, my God. And <laughs> yeah, it's, it's unfortunate. You are listening to Light Talk, and today we are sponsored by... This is a public service announcement from No More, 10 out of 12s. Like cowboys, wagon trains, and the buffalo, tumbleweeds are icons of the Old West. These twisted balls of dead foliage rolling across deserts and the open range are staples of Western movies and the American imagination. Not unlike roadies. That's right. <laughs> On the first day of tumbleweed season, I would like to discuss the humble tumbleweed as metaphor for the disappearing American roadie. First, are tumbleweeds good for anything? The lowly, ill-regard tumbleweed might be good for something. A study reveals that tumbleweeds have a knack for soaking up depleted uranium from contaminated soil at weapons, testing grounds, and <laughs> battlefields. Are roadies good for anything? Of course they are. How many times have they opened a feeder box just to see the cable loaded backwards? How many times have they said plug red to red and blue to blue only to see red to blue and from somewhere white plugged into black? Do they complain? No, they just go about their day correcting problems. All the time listening to a Greek chorus of, how about a t-shirt, man? Second, do tumbleweeds really explode? While the tumbleweed has become a cliché of the American West in film, the reality is that they're actually quite dangerous, especially during a drought, because they can suddenly burst into flames and bounce around, causing an already out-of-control blaze to grow even larger. Do roadies explode? <laughs> when confronted with fried chicken for 14 state days, a tour bus that sleeps 12 but has 14 on board and a bottom bunk surrounded by stinky work boots, what else can a roadie do but explode? And third, what are the tumbleweed before it dies? A tumbleweed, sometimes called a wind witch, is one of the distinctive symbols of the West. When it matures, the remains break off at the root and blow away with the winds. As it tumbles and bounces and travels the roads of America, it disperses its seeds, as many as 250,000 per plant, thus ensuring the next generation of tumbleweeds. What of the roadie before he dies? Some roadies who worked in the 1960s and 70s wrote books about wild parties, drug use, and spreading their seed, not unlike the tumbleweed, <laughs> thus ensuring the next generation of roadies. In summary, it's not easy being a tumbleweed or a roadie. Both wake up early and go to sleep late. Bouncing along with no place to call home can be a hard life. Trapped by a fence or trapped in a crowded Ford Econoline van, reduced to mulch by the DOT, or staking out some floor space in a shared hotel room. Yes, the tumbleweed and the roadie have many things in common, but I suggest it is the love of music that keeps the tumbleweed and the roadie truly connected. <laughs> Just ask Roy Rogers. He may have said it best. Deep in my heart is a song. Here on the range I belong, drifting along with the tumbling tumbleweeds. Or maybe it was Willie Nelson who said, On the road again, just can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is making music with my friends, and I can't wait to get on the road again. Be the tumbleweed, my friend, rolling across America. This has been a public service announcement from No More, 10 out of 12s. <laughs> well, you know, there is a difference between roadies and tumbleweeds. Uh, tumbleweeds. Now, you live out in tum Tumbleweed <laughs> oh, Central man. out there. I California I, is I, it. I, it. I'm telling you, I was, I was uh, going through um, a Joshua Tree a couple of years ago, and uh, I was traveling very fast in my Tesla. It was around 90 miles an hour, and a tumbleweed foolishly tumbled in my way and got completely <laughs> wiped out. I mean, it literally exploded. It looked like something from Star Wars into tiny little fragments. And uh, I don't see many roadies <laughs> being run over by, by cars, <laughs> thank God. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's tumbleweeds are kind of interesting creatures, aren't they? They can bury houses. They can bury roads. I mean, I do not understand. I was looking at Etsy. Yeah. And people are buying tumbleweeds. A, a four-foot oh tumbleweed is $85. 
Come down to Texas, buddy. <laughs> Come on be, down here. I can, I, can, <laughs> I can drive you two hours out to the prairie all you want, and they're free. Okay, okay. That you've, I've got a new idea for swag. I'm, I, I'm driving I'm driving to LDI. You know, I'm driving. I'm going to drive. Lori and I are driving to LDI. By the way, that's another thing. Lori, who is the voiceover artist of Light Talk, will be with us. Uh, she won't be on the panel, but she'll be there, okay? So I, you, I need her because I'm thinking about a Bobby Danger for- she, um, She's the one, man. Uh, oh, we, we got it. Okay. We, we need her. All right, but anyway, we're driving there and on Friday, and then I'm driving back Saturday because I have a gig Saturday night that I have to play at here in LA. Uh, but on our way, we're going to collect tumbleweeds. We're going to throw them in the back next to the uh, Light Talk Not Ready for Dishwashers. Hey, yeah. You know, mugs and all, and all the, the, the thousands of uh, little uh, shot glasses we have. And I'm going to have special Light Talk tumbleweeds. So, <laughs> and they'll be free. Okay. So, come to the Light Talk right. show. You may win a tumbleweed. Save your <laughs> you know, $5. I, <laughs> you know, a fact I did not know, and it is hard to believe, tumbleweeds are in all lower 48. I didn't know that. Oh, I, I can't one imagine. In Florida. There's no tumbleweeds I, in Florida. I'm sorry. I can't. Well, there are 12 varieties of tumbleweed. But they don't tumble. Well, they're too small. It's like a mudweed yeah, in and those Florida. Are called, those are called crabs, by the way. The tumbleweeds <laughs> of Florida are tumbleweeds, little land crabs that move along the streets. And now, back to Light Talk. <laughs> Well, the sound of those rabid ducks means that once again, it's time for Let's Talk About. And today's Let's Talk About is about the Travis Scott concert. Okay, so we all know that it was a terrible thing that happened last week. You know, it's funny, Steve. It's not funny, but it's interesting. Last week, we were talking about another issue, and I think you said it just gets worse and worse every week, (laughs) right? And here we are well, again. You, you know, I, I was thinking about this. I was down in Mexico City and got trapped in a crowd. And there were four of us. And I actually, for the first time in my life, was actually scared. Oh, yeah. Because it's, the crowd just kept compacting in on us. It is scary. Uh, I it's, mean. It feels like you're suffocating. And, well, you are. Yeah. yeah. You are. That's one of the things I read today was, sadly, one, you know, one of the people did die from suffocation. Yeah. They simply compress this individual to where uh, this person could not could not breathe right. any longer. Yeah. Yeah, people pass out. Now, it's, a lot of people revo- were revived. So it wasn't just about these eight unfortunate souls who died. There were probably 50 or 60 people who were passed out and were revived. So uh, a lot of people were injured uh, for this. But I have a solution to this, okay? I really do. I'd be surprised... If it actually is taken, you know, that they actually follow this, but it's the only way to solve this problem. Because, look, I'm not going to blame this on rap music, and I'm not even going to blame it on Travis, okay? Uh, I think he should have stopped the concert, absolutely, okay? So he does have some shared responsibility. But this happened at a Who concert about, I don't know, 15, yeah. 20 years ago, okay? Where we had a bunch no, of people it was like. In the 70s, right? Oh, was it that it far was back? The, it was, it, yeah. yeah, it was in the Keith Moon era. <laughs> yeah, the Keith Moon era. Now, the Who wasn't the type of band that said that, that were, in, you know, we're basically instigating this, which is part of Travis's shtick, by the way. He basically tells people, hey, jump off that, you know, that, uh, uh, that 30 foot ledge there or that balcony. Right. And they call it, they call it crowd diving. And some poor man who was behind somebody, he was actually in front, was pushed off. And he was paralyzed. I mean, that's horrible. He wasn't trying to jump off. He was pushed off. Uh, there, there have been several instance, instances, and, and he has actually pleaded guilty to some of these uh, situations. So I think that he does have some shared responsibility. But I'm going to tell you who the real culprit is. It's Live Nation. And the reason why I say that is because these concert promoters want to make as much money as possible, so they want to cram in as many people as possible, which means that if you have people standing, you could fit a lot more people in an area than if you actually had seats there. So I think that the way to stop this, or what, uh, it would go a long way, certainly, is to get rid of general admission. No more general admission. 
There's a seat for everyone. When I go to concerts, now listen, I'm an old guy, right? I'm not out in the mosh pits, okay? <laughs> but I'm in a nice seat. I'm in a seat. Usually up, you know, if I'm at the Greek theater, I'm, I'm elevated in one of the side loges, which is fantastic. Nobody stands in front of me. I get a clear view and, no, and there's going to be no shenanigans up there. But, you know, but down in the mosh pit, there's tons of shenanigans. And when you're in a situation like a, this type of concert uh, where the artist is, wants that energy, wants to the, the, have the crowd you know, doing crazy things, it could be deadly and it's deadly. So I think it, the time has come to outlaw general admission. What do you guys think? You know, you know I don't think that uh, it's just the artist it, like igniting the crowd in that way. You know, I don't know if you saw this, but Billy Joel actually suspended ticket sales from a few of his upcoming concerts because they wanted to reevaluate the amount of people or the amount of tickets that were being sold in that venue you know, because I think that, you know, you go to a concert, it's already an, an elevated level of energy, regardless of the, the, the artist. And if you're, you're packed in there standing up for two hours and you're all excited and into it, things can easily go wrong. And so I think that I'm glad to see that it's someone like Billy Joel, an artist is taking responsibility, saying, I want to make sure that. There's not more people in that venue than that venue should have in the venue. Well, Billy Joel can say that because he's very, right. I mean, very that, I mean, that's a whole yeah, other thing, yeah, too, is like yeah. the the economics of how touring works now and, and who makes money and how money is made, you know, and what percentage goes to the artist and all that. It, it makes it very challenging to to be a touring artist today and actually make a living doing it. And that's right. so you. It's so you're going to end up with all kinds of potentially risky behavior because everyone is trying to make sure that they can make a buck. And you're absolutely right, Zach. Yeah. yeah. But it can change, you know, through laws and through local laws. Oh, yeah. If L.A. County came out and says there will be no more general admission uh, in any of our concert, any concert, any live event, no general admission, then things will change. It's not going to be the promoters. The promoters ain't going to do it. But if somebody's an artist like Billy Joel's that big, who actually earns a lot of money through uh, through licensing right. and things like that, you know, he could afford to do it. Uh, but um, Steely Dan, they couldn't do it. They lost most of their publishing rights. So the only way they do make money to this right. day is by live, you know, by the live touring. performance. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's gone full circle. You know, when we first started doing this in the '60s and '70s. Um, you know, people brought, came to a, a small coliseum. You know, I, I grew up in Knoxville, so the coliseum there seated 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. It was built for like a uh, super low farm team hockey club. Uh, but when I first started going, you know, people brought a blanket and a pillow. Mm -hmm. And you sat on the floor and you watched the concert. And then it kind of evolved into seats mm -hmm. on the floor. And I thought, well, this is nice. I don't have to sit on the floor anymore. <laughs> But then pretty soon, all of a sudden, you started seeing festival seating. And festival seating meant you can come stand on the floor and watch the concert. Uh, and I I've, I've vividly remember going to a Jethro Tull concert, and it wasn't sold out. 5,000 seater, it's not sold out. But there's, you know, 3,500 people there probably. Most of them had tickets in the, in the um, seats. And I remember on stage, you know, someone said, come on down, come on down to the floor and be part of the show. And all of a sudden, I don't think all 3,500 people came down, but the seating area really emptied out. And every, all of a sudden, there is a massive crowd standing down on the arena floor watching the concert. So I, I think I agree with you. I think this is a problem. I, I don't think unless cities uh, get involved in this, there's not a promoter out there who's going to go back to, uh, can I sell a 1,000 seat floors or can I sell 1,800 standing room? It, it's, it's, it's all about money. I, I'm afraid you're right. I will say in, in the D.C. area, we have two venues that are sort of indoor-outdoor. Um, you know, there's the Wolf Trap and there's the Meriwether Post Pavilion, 
where they have a seating area that's like the orchestra section in a traditional theater. And then their general admission is like the lawn seating that is outside of the pavilion where the performance is. And, and I mean, obviously, you know, I went to see Yacht Rock Review there. So yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Was there a festival crowd there? I mean, were people crowd surfing and stuff like that for Yacht Rock? There was people <laughs> with blankets and boxes of wine. Yeah, uh, there you go. That's Yacht Rock. Yeah. yeah. But I think that, that in a way, it's almost like it's turning the table by making – the the cheap seats or the general admission seats. I've been to other concerts too, where people are up and about and moving and dancing and stuff in that area. But it's almost like you're taking those people away from the stage and putting them in an area where there's more space. And maybe that's another thing to look into as well. Look, this I, I used to do the festival seating all the time when I was a kid. You know, like Steve said. And it was, but nobody ever rioted like that, unless you're in Altamont. You know, I mean, Altamont was a horrible situation. Right. And that had a lot to do with the Hells Angels. Times have changed. And you know something? People have changed. You know, they're very violent. Boy, do I sound like an old fart. But it's true. <laughs> it's become sort of like an accepted culture thing that that, you know, this is a place where you can, if you have built up aggression that that is associated with that kind of music that you can go and, and do these things. And yeah. it's sort of just accepted that that's, oh, that's just the way it is. Well, Zach, I want um, you to promise me something. How old, first of all, how, how old is your son who loves Yacht Rock? He's eight. All right. All right. There was a man. We got a shot glass for him coming. Yeah. <laughs> a shot no. glass of milk. <laughs> a shot glass of, of Ovaltine. There was a man with his nine-year-old son on his shoulders at this Travis. First of all, why would you take a nine-year-old to a Travis right. Scott concert? Now, if you take a nine, an eight-year-old to a Yacht Rock concert, that kid is perfectly safe, okay? There's nothing's going to happen to him. But this guy took his nine-year-old son had him up on his shoulders. He passed out from the crowd. The kid Oof. fell down and was trampled and almost died. And he's actually in a coma right now, the kid. That's horrible. Now, you know, you don't take kids to, I mean, why are there 14-year-olds there? Yeah, I, I just, yeah, boy, do I sound old. I sound just like my parents. It's horrible. But I think we've reached a point where you got to be careful about, you know, you got to know who the artist is and what the artist's reputation is. For instance, when Jim Morrison would perform, you didn't know what the hell was going on. I mean, I would never allow my kid to go see Jim Morrison, but my parents allowed me to go see him when I was like 13. No, oh, back then the artist got arrested, not the audience. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened to Jim Morrison. <laughs> he actually did yeah. get arrested. That was the case. You knew what you were getting into with Jim Morrison. So I don't know. I, I just think people have to be you know, better judges of what they're doing, what their kids are doing, and uh, not put people in, um, in harm's way. And the artist needs to act responsibly, too. You know, we were talking earlier about, as lighting designers, what do we do and when something like this happens? Do we tell them to turn on all the lights? Who is in control there? Is it the police? Security? Someone needs to say... We have to stop the concert. There's an ambulance coming through the middle of the crowd. Right. But how many concerts do you go to? And, you know, what, do we, what are we really expecting from security at these concerts? I mean, I can't tell you how many. That, yeah, there's one guy or one lady there who kind of knows what they're doing. And then they're handing out yellow T-shirts to 50 minimum wage workers who are kind of watching the concert. But, I mean, they're not – they don't know. They're, they're not – trained in first aid. They're not trained in, in crowd control. I mean, th th we, but we put these people at risk too. It sounds like this is an expected behavior though, that just like went a little further. And I think everybody is, especially now that we've all been sort of locked in our houses for almost two years, like the people who want to go to a concert and I say go crazy with like finger quotes, because when I say go crazy, I mean, just like let loose. I don't mean actually become physically violent. Like you've got two years of that stored up in you. It's going to be over the top. Yeah. But I'm, I'm even surprised that everybody wants to be so close to each other still. I know that's crazy. It, it, even if you take the physical violence out of it, you know, there's always going to be a few people. But if we just think about the crowd in general, if you're 30 rows back. And you're the back of the crowd pushing forward. You're laughing. You're giggling. Right. You're pushing. You have no idea what's happening to the front row. And so those first couple of rows up there, they're relying on the producer 
to provide a safe environment for them. And that, again, that does start with security. That does start, you know, with a, with a, with a plan. And I doubt there was ever a plan. It's Live Nation. They're responsible. They're responsible for security. They're responsible for all that. They hired like right. 70. I mean, in this instance. In this instance, you're right. Because there are others promoter. that are responsible for the same kind of stuff in different venues. It's not Absolutely. just Live Nation. You're right. You're right, Zach. It is not just, I, I should be just pointing yeah. out, but they are a monopoly and they do deal with most of these well, yeah. large concerts. Yes. Well, the lawsuits hit the newspaper today yeah. in Texas. Well, they, they so, should be. Yeah. And I think money will talk in this case. If we start yeah. getting some multi million dollar settlements here, uh, money will talk and their insurance companies will talk as well. So, David has our last question. Boy, David, I got to come up with an answer, that means. Okay, John from Pasadena asks, I need to replace my conventional Lycos. I have about 120 at 36 degrees and 80 at 26 degrees. I want to convert my space to LEDs. What do you think is a good number of replacement fixtures given the color-changing ability of new fixtures? I simply cannot afford 200 new fixtures, but I can come close. Are Zooms the answer? Wow. Okay. I'm just going to tell you a story right now, a real quick one, because it's a show that load, it's loading in this week for me at, at uh, uh, the University of Southern California that I, I help out my friend um, uh, Ken every year, uh, you know, with his shows. And uh, th their, their theater, the Bing Theater, used to have about, I don't know, 200... Um, uh, uh, various source fours. Uh, there are about 60 zooms and the rest are either 36, 26 uh, degrees. And I would use them all. Okay. <laughs> I would just use them all. And, and, you know, a handful of moving lights, you know, maybe six or eight moving lights. It's a pretty big size stage and uh, it's a really lovely theater. I do love this theater. They've moved all the way on to LED and they bought 57 LED bodies. Uh, ETC LED uh, uh, engines so that they can use the old uh, lens trains, right? So my plot for the show that loaded in yesterday has about 70 fixtures on it. So I've cut more than half. And the reason why is because in front of house, if I have 10 areas in front of house, I used to have like 20 fixtures doing 10 areas. I'd have like one, you know, two colors for each area. I'd be able to mix them through additive color mixing, right? Now I have 10 lights. And those 10 lights, I can get any color I want. I can't just get the limitations of if you have like a, a Roscoe 64 and a no color, you can get anything between those two, but you're not going to get reds or anything like that or lavenders. But now I can. So it all opens up the flexibility. My torms, instead of having six lights on a torm, I have three lights on a torm and a lot more color options. So to answer your question, <laughs> yes, you can cut at least 60% off your light plots. Very easily. So you don't need to buy 200 more fixtures. You only need to buy, I don't know, maybe between 70 and 100 uh, LED bodies for the lens trains that you have right now. What do you guys think? I think that's really good advice. I'm writing it down because I'm <laughs> about to do the same thing in our theater. Yeah, you don't need all those lights. Uh, There's no reason. No, you don't. Yeah. No, you don't. It's not like they're just projectors sitting around doing nothing. Yeah, right. Like a bunch of panties. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, I love panties. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, the rocking sounds of the Luminoids tells us that once again, you've spent another morning listening to Light Talk. You can hear our show on Spotify, iTunes, Google, YouTube, LiveDesignOnline.com, Amazon Prime Music, and just about every podcast site out there. Check out our website on lighttalk.org and be sure to follow us on Facebook and subscribe to our podcast. That way you will not miss a second of Light Talk Insanity. No guarantee is offered regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast. However, if you do decide to litigate the law firm of Flecht, Flocked, Flair, and Glare, and their paralegal Snoot, will defend us until our retirement funds are depleted. Light Talk is written and produced by the Lumen Brothers, coming to you from Long Beach, Washington, D.C., and the Republic of Texas. And be sure to tune in next week for our special... Light Talk live at LDI show. Yay! Yay.
It's not really live, okay, but hey, whatever. But taping it Friday. Well, it's live for the people in the room. That's right. It's live for the people in the room. And whoever the lucky one is who gets that special not ready for dishwasher light talk travel mug, boy, you're going to be a guest on our show. <laughs> there you go. Light talk, broadcasting questionable lumen knowledge and humor around the world. So we'll see you all next Friday. <laughs> bye bye. In Vegas. Light talk in Vegas. Bye bye. Nice talk.